Remember to turn on all notifications so you don't miss a video. I'm starting this April 25th, but to my viewers, it will probably look like I disappeared for a while. I think Teen Titans is the greatest western cartoon ever. I've always wanted to talk about it, but I was never able to finish what I started. I had one video on my main channel, that was supposed to be a series. Then I rewatched the whole show, and restarted on my second channel, but I didn't know the best direction to take the series. Now I've decided to try something new. I'll watch each episode and analyze anything that comes to mind. The main topics I plan to discuss are characters, plot, theme, and maybe setting. Without further ado, this is my retrospective or in-depth review of Teen Titans Season 1. The introductory scene had great music. I feel like this show's music would be much more appreciated if they released an official soundtrack with all of the songs used. On my last rewatch, I remember a couple of episodes that had me desperately looking for the songs that played. This is me from the future. I just found out by accident that the official soundtrack for seasons 1 and 2 have been released. The song is titled Jailbreak. The entrance of the Titans is dramatic in a kind of cheesy way, but I like it. Overall, the story starting end media rays and getting straight to the action allows the episode to have great pacing. We start with a fight, which is not only entertaining, but it introduces us to their powers and establishes the internal conflict that will last the episode. The theme song is great, though I would have preferred if they cut it in a way so that the full chorus would play instead of doing the verse, half chorus, verse, half chorus, because the full chorus sounds much better due to the extended chord progression. The fight isn't really good, but it does a great job at establishing the fact that the Titans aren't completely used to working together. None of them are attacking as a group. Beast Boy also ends up getting in Raven's way, and the one time Robin and Cyborg try to work together, they fail. There was this one stylistic scene where Cyborg and Cinderblock were clashing as black silhouettes from a side view. I thought that was really unique and visually appealing. There are a lot of jokes in Teen Titans. In this episode, some of them hit, some of them miss. Kids shows usually have a low field goal percentage when it comes to jokes, probably because they use the excuse it's for kids, but this does a decent job. The personalities of the characters are also shown off very well. Robin and Cyborg are the least straightforward in terms of characterization. They have multiple layers, and it's hard to pinpoint their primary trait. The other three are pretty simple. Beast Boy is the comic relief, Starfire is the nice girl, and Raven is the aloof one. A trait that will continue throughout the story is having one or two characters as the focus of the episode. The character will usually receive a character arc that represents the theme of the episode. I love this idea because it takes advantage of the episodic formula. In a serial show, you can't just switch out the main character whenever you feel like it. You have to stick with that character until the end of the story arc, but with episodic shows, since each episode is self-contained, each episode can have a different main character. It also allows for a story to execute 10 themes and character arcs in 10 episodes. In a serial show, it would be extremely difficult to pull that off. This is a great way to handle a group of characters and give each character a good amount of focus. TMNT 2012 did something similar if I remember correctly. This episode focuses on Robin and Cyborg, which is probably why they are the least simplistic out of the five. Each thinks the other is incompetent due to the Sonic Boom failure. I might be overthinking it, but I believe that this is subtle setup for Cyborg being dissatisfied with Robin's leadership, which will lead to him getting his own team in Season 3. Here, Cyborg quitting the team was very melodramatic. Maybe he just got really emotional, but the five seemed to be friends through their interactions. An example would be Robin lending a hand to bring Cyborg up and the existence of their team attack. However, it is shown that this was an extreme reaction on both parts, because despite Robin saying that the team didn't need Cyborg, once he quit, Robin's reaction shows that he immediately regretted it. Another trait that will carry throughout the seasons is having an overarching antagonist. Season 1 has Slade. Introducing him in the first episode is a great way to let the audience know that there will be an overarching story. Slade is a Batman villain, so it's fitting that Robin, Batman's sidekick, will have to fight him. Back with the Titans, this scene adds a little more characterization to the group. Beast Boy tries to reach out and make jokes, doubling down on his funny guy status. Starfire has her foreigner trope added. For Raven, it's revealed that she puts up a stoic persona to keep her powers in check and that she's actually bothered by Cyborg's departure. The music that plays when Star goes to Robin is another great track. Future Yume again, this song is titled Robin's Regret. Robin, similar to Raven, keeps his composure, or at least pretends to, even suggesting that the situation is optimal. It's interesting how each character deals with the issue in a different way. I can't remember the actual quote or where I heard this, but some writer said something along the lines of, in a sitcom, each character should react to the same situation in a different way. That was their way of measuring whether they had a dynamic group of characters or a stale and repetitive group. That applies to this scene. Robin's sequence of daily life emphasizing the hole that Cyborg left is great. His words don't match his actions. And the sequence ends with him apologizing. This is amazing writing. The fight against Plasmas is a nice contrast to the first because now they are working together as a team. 
Robin gives Star an order. Raven saves Star. Beast Boy and Starfire attack together, and it ends with all four working together to tie him up. The animation has some occasional Sakuga spikes as well, which is surprising in a western cartoon. Raven's role as the straight man to Beast Boy's funny man is established here and will become more prominent. Cyborg coming back to save Robin was great. Them successfully executing the Sonic Boom combo at the end is just perfect setup and payoff. They split because of his failure, but when they reunite, it works. It being the move to defeat the antagonist was also genius. Both of them saying Teen Titans Go before the attack reinforces the setup to Cyborg being a leader. The way Robin and Cyborg casually make up really feels authentic and realistic. Robin just says, sorry about, uh, and Cyborg accepts it. It's like longtime friends who get into fights, but ultimately come back together. With my friends, I usually don't have to apologize because we realize that we just have different views and no one was necessarily wrong. But in this case, I'm glad Robin apologized because he was actually in the wrong. He pointed the first finger and suggested that Cyborg wasn't needed. I'd say the theme of this episode is, don't let your ego ruin your relationships. I like how both Robin and Cyborg were thinking that there was a mastermind. Once again, it shows their similarities and sets up Cyborg for a leadership role in the future. This was a great first episode. The first scene sets up the romance between Robin and Starfire that is only paid off in the movie. It also reinforces her foreigner archetype when she says that she didn't feel like she belonged. This is a setup for the internal conflict of the episode. Cyborg and Beast Boy's friendship is also established here, while Beast Boy and Raven's comedic dynamic is reinforced. During the fight, Robin establishes that he is him by destroying the foe on his own. I didn't notice when watching the episode, but when listening to the soundtrack, the song is No More Chasing Please, which is the same song used in the Cartoon Network game Battle Blitz. That's very nostalgic, and it's a good song. Blackfire is the main antagonist of the episode. She's a great foil for Star. Their designs are contrasted, with Starfire having bright colors and Blackfire having black. Their personalities are also contrasted. Star's politeness was emphasized during the fight with the tentacle robot by her asking the robot to leave her alone and even apologizing. This is contrasted with Blackfire, whose first line is slightly putting down Starfire, although humorously. Later, she waves off Star and demands her to bring her a drink. There is also contrast in how each of them fit into Earth. Star already talked about how she felt like she didn't fit, but this is also implicitly told to us by her strange foreign customs in this episode and the last. This one has the poem that she was about to sing, which the others didn't seem to want to hear. However, Blackfire immediately gels with the Titans, with only the knowledge of what her sister told her. This contrast propels the episode's internal conflict. Side note, the jokes really land in this episode. It's shooting 90% from the field. Starfire interrupting Robin and Blackfire's bonding is a nice subtle touch. The scene also establishes that Blackfire is a rule breaker, while Starfire is not, which is set up for Blackfire being the antagonist. The next scene of the aliens looking for the girl also sets up the Blackfire plot twist. Anyone who's really paying attention might be able to predict that they're after the present that she got for her sister. Blackfire's manipulative nature is really conveyed well in just her first scene. She immediately found a way to put the heat on someone else without them noticing, and then got in the good graces of the Titans by using her knowledge of their interests. In the next scenes, it's revealed that Blackfire has been furthering her connections to the Titans and seems to be even closer to them than her sister. And then she dresses up like her too. I wouldn't let somebody steal my swagger, I'm just saying. Her manipulation is so authentic. Even at the party, Starfire is out of place, Blackfire is in her element. The Titans walking around in their costumes is kind of weird. I don't think they should have had secret identities, but I think they could at least wear casual outfits over their suits when they aren't in action. Minor nitpick. All of this setup of Blackfire being the cooler version of Starfire and the Titans spending more time with her genuinely makes it feel like Blackfire is a replacement. This episode does a great job at making the audience feel what the character is feeling. Robin being the one to comfort Star shows a friendlier side to him, just like with the intro scene. In the first episode, he just felt like their leader, but in this episode, he feels like their friend. It's a small detail, but I love how he tries to stop Blackfire from interrupting his attempt to comfort a friend. Based on the rest of the episode, it might seem like he'd just gravitate to anything Blackfire was doing, but this moment highlights his priorities. He reiterates this the next time he appears. Blackfire initially standing back while her sister was being attacked is another hint to the plot twist. So is her knowledge of the enemy's weak points. Her having eye lasers is another cool setup because Starfire doesn't have this ability at the moment and will awaken them in a later episode. This reinforces the Blackfire is a better Starfire idea along with the line about being the better fighter. Robin and Cyborg say Teen Titans go again. The setup is definitely intentional. Cyborg asking Black to join the team is the nail in the coffin for Starfire. This understandably causes Star to want to leave after being replaced. This is the midpoint of the episode, which is either a false defeat or a false victory. Starfire getting captured fires the gun on the wall and basically reveals that they were after Blackfire and that she used Starfire's bait. 
I also liked the Chekhov's cape. With Blackfire, Robin was boasting about how strong his cape was. In the fight against the aliens, he uses his cape to deflect an attack, which leads to the ship being damaged, ending the fight. This is when the alien police and the Titans uncover Blackfire's plan. This mystery was very well written. It won't be the last time this season has a great mystery. The conflict between the sisters going from internal to external was poetic. Although I wish Star had actually beaten her. Maybe she wasn't allowed to because Blackfire was the better fighter. Her nice girl archetype is reinforced in her last interaction with her sister. She's kind and polite despite Blackfire trying to put her in jail for her own crimes. The animation here is pretty good. At the end, there's a nice anime bloom effect. The theme of the episode is no one can take your place. So far, these are great themes. I don't think mature is the right word, but these themes are applicable to audiences of all ages. It wouldn't be strange if they appeared in a show or a movie aimed at adults. How does the Hive Academy even work? They just have an academy for raising supervillains. It's hilariously goofy, but I love the Hive trio. The way they're dramatically introduced, showing off their powers with a narration, is charmingly cheesy. But there's a reason for this. They're being pitched to Slade. Slade gives them a test, destroy the Teen Titans, and in two minutes, we know our antagonist and conflict. The Cyborg Beast Boy Raven trio makes his appearance again. This time, she interacts with Cyborg. I actually never noticed how often they make a trio. Once again, the comedy is shooting buckets. The Titans argue at home and at a restaurant. This is set up for the internal conflict. I'm just gonna say, this scene had great characterization anytime the character's unique personalities are reinforced, because it happens a lot. I've also noticed that Robin's personality is the hardest to pinpoint. You could say that he's the leader, but that's not a personality trait, and it only really shows up when they're fighting. When they're chilling, he can be serious or relaxed. I'd say that he's the second most serious after Raven. I looked at what the wiki said to see if they noticed something I didn't. They started with leader, then they list a bunch of character traits, none of which stand out as his main trait. They have stoic and brooding listed, but again, he's only like that when dealing with crime. When chilling, he's a regular guy. For contrast, look at Raven, who's always quiet and serious, regardless of whether they're chilling or fighting. I guess he's the regular guy of the group. The Titans show off their teamwork again to counter the Hive's teamwork. The Hive display more teamwork, which results in them having the upper hand. Again, some of these jokes are timeless. Robin tries too hard to be him and gets eliminated from the equation. Once again, the loss of Robin evokes different reactions. Cyborg blames himself, and Starfire takes out her anger on Beast Boy and Raven. When Robin is gone, Cyborg gives the order of split up. He's the second in command. The Titans get wrecked again, and Cyborg loses an arm. I actually like how they give the heroes an opportunity to lose and come back. It shows that they aren't invincible, and it allows them to grow. But getting slapped out of your own house is crazy. I wouldn't let that happen to me. The Bloom Effect returns in the scene of the Titans reflection. The dysfunction of the team returns, primarily through Cyborg. Robin coming back at the moment of despair, the midpoint, is cliche but epic. This is also a false defeat midpoint, which makes me realize that this show has good story structure. The Hive are too disrespectful. They stole their house and rearranged it to fit their image. Gizmo even hung up Cyborg's arm as a trophy, but the Chekhov's arm on the wall activates and starts the comeback. I love the way the Hive are attacked without the Titans ever appearing. It makes the heroes feel threatening. I got a nerd out on the music. The song that played when they lost, Titans Ejected, and the song that plays when they take back their tower, Helping Hand, share a musical light motif. It's a little guitar part. That's like what film scores do. Listening to the songs on their own really allows me to appreciate the greatness of this OST. Like the first episode, the Titans actually use teamwork. Robin and Cyborg, Beast Boy and Starfire, and all five against Mammoth. The dysfunction becomes function. At the end, the Titans learn about Slate's existence. The Chekhov's remote is a nice touch. Its disappearance was the first thing that caused dysfunction, but when they unite, they find it. Very poetic. I'd say the theme of this episode is teamwork makes the dream work. This episode is simpler than the other two because there was no main character and the internal struggle wasn't prominent. They couldn't beat the Hive because they weren't working as a team, and then they beat the Hive with teamwork. The internal conflict is so tied to the external conflict, unlike the past episodes where each conflict worked in tandem but could exist on its own. This was still a fun episode that made up for its lesser depth with a lot of action and comedy. The comedy trio is back again and a prank goes wrong. So far this is the most melodramatic and unbelievable internal conflict. Beast Boy accidentally pulls a prank on Starfire and is for some reason unable to apologize properly. And then Starfire, the nice girl, gets so mad at him that she starts acting uncharacteristically petty. This childishness lasts for half the episode and really brings it down. There's nothing wrong with characters getting emotional and acting mature, 
Robin and Cyborg did it in the first episode, and it was pretty good. But making characters act out of character in order to have an internal conflict is an issue. Star, the nice one, getting mad at the known funny guy for pranking her accidentally for half the episode, and the funny guy not being able to apologize is just not believable. Thunder and Lightning are simple mischievous villains, but Beast Boy forcing Thunder to reflect on his actions early on quickly adds depth to Thunder. If he's mature enough to reason with a villain, you'd think he'd be mature enough to immediately apologize for an accident. And then the fact that Cyborg and Raven don't do anything to try and help the issue is crazy. What kind of friends let friends fight like that? I don't know if the old man is ever revealed to be Slade through the show, but he's Slade. He also kind of sounds like him. I like how he and Lightning serve as the devil on Thunder's shoulder, while Beast Boy serves as the angel. This internal struggle is good enough to carry the episode, so I don't know why the petty melodrama was needed. Halfway through the episode, Beast Boy apologizes and Starfire immediately forgives him. So she was acting petty to force him to apologize? The ball was definitely dropped on this one. During the final battle, the theme is said by Beast Boy to Thunder. Gifts don't make you better, just different. It's how you use them that counts. End quote. After this, Thunder has a heel face turn and fights his brother. Thunder is able to reason with his brother, and they apply the theme by working together to use rain to put out the fire monster. This was great. Musical light motifs appear in this episode again. The end of the track Thunder and Lightning has a melody that plays in No Harm in Our Fun. So when Lightning zaps the old man, Slade's mask is shown underneath. This is the first time the Titans have encountered Slade in person. The overarching plot builds. They really should have removed the Beast Boy and Starfire plotline. It was unnecessary and out of character. This was written by Adam Beechin, who also wrote Mad Mod, Only Human, and Haunted. Mad Mod was okay, but Only Human was great, and Haunted was elite. One of the most mature, memorable episodes in the show, so I really don't know what happened here. This is the first Cyborg solo episode. What's interesting is that it's one of the few times where the supernatural aspects of the characters are pivotal to the internal conflict, which is a great use of the setting. Starfire and Raven also get episodes like this. I don't think Robin or Beast Boy had anything like this. Anyway, the episode is about Cyborg's struggle with his Cyborg body. The handicapped kid relating to Cyborg was surprisingly mature. I don't think you should only be able to relate to people based on physical qualities, but that's another conversation. The kid sounded like Ben 10. I'm noticing that Robin likes to pull up on his villains with one-liners. He did it in the last episode too. It reminds me of how Jotaro always comes up with a one-liner before defeating his opponent. Seeing Robin's concern for Cyborg really emphasizes how the team is a group of friends. The first scene where Cyborg shut down did that as well. Cyborg says Titans go again. The villain, Mumbo Jumbo, feels like a throwaway villain in this episode. He has a personality, but there was no reason it had to be him, and he isn't really relevant to the plot. It also simply serves as a distracting B-plot. Fixit is the real antagonist of this episode. He wants to turn Cyborg into a complete robot. This external conflict forces Cyborg to confront his robot side. The only downside is how the story seems to frame the human side as fully positive and the robot side as negative. The robot side causes the initial problem, and Cyborg doesn't want to become a full robot. He even says that his biological component is the best part of him, and the part that makes him who he is. Obviously, his robot half allows him to fight crime, but this positive is never acknowledged in this episode. If his robot parts were treated like something that came with pros and cons, and Cyborg reflected on this, the episode would have been far more nuanced. Future episodes do something like this. In the end, Cyborg helps fix it, realize the value of the human side. What's funny is that Cyborg actually echoes a sentiment similar to mine when the kid comes back. He says, it's not your arm that makes us the same, it's the stuff that's connected to it, while pointing at the heart. This is the theme of the episode. This was alright. I think the B-plot could have had a stronger connection to the A-plot, and the theme could have had more nuance. This is the first episode focused on Raven. Just like the last episode, this one uses the character's supernatural traits as the engine for the internal conflict. Raven acted demonic against Dr. Light, and the Titans noticed something was wrong. When listening to the OST, I realized how epic the song in this scene was. It's called Raven Freaks. In this episode, when Beast Boy pisses Raven off, every single Titan chimes in to try and get him to fix the problem. When BB tries to bail, Cyborg comes along for extra measure. That's how friends are supposed to act. Compare that to Forces of Nature, where everyone just lets the beef run its course. The jokes are funny here too. I believe this is the first time one of the Titans rooms are shown in detail. It's cool how they're all personalized. The different Ravens are just amazing. They provide so much character development, are a unique concept, and make this episode one of the most memorable ones in the show. The first episode already gave us a large hint that Raven's actions don't always match what she actually feels. It could be inferred that she does this to keep her powers under control based on the damage that she does after lying, but this episode solidifies this concept. And then Trigon appears, 
at Chekhov's gun that'll fire in season 4. The duo deciding to stay, even after being told to go, shows true camaraderie. While listening to the OST, Through the Looking Glass Part 2 is a great track. So is Titan's Face Statue, and so is Good Fights Red, which has one light motif from Raven Freaks and another from Titan's Face Statue. Raven turns white when she's fully powered, another thing that'll come up later. This story is good at planting seeds. They beat the boss, and Beast Boy and Raven become closer. The theme might be friends stick together. I'm not too sure on this one. Great episode overall. It's definitely my favorite so far. This is a Starfire and Raven episode. Pairing opposites together can easily make for an entertaining story, and this episode does that by putting the energetic and kind Starfire with the aloof and quiet Raven. After the villain intro, the episode jumps right into the two personalities clashing. The Titans bringing in a box from an anonymous sender is so irresponsible, but I guess the plot had to happen somehow. Then they start playing with the puppet replicas of themselves with no suspicion whatsoever. They got caught lacking here. A little bit of each person's room is shown before they get controlled. The last episode used the unique setting to have the characters bond, that being Raven's mirror. This one does something similar. The two girls switch bodies and have to learn how to use the other's powers. In doing so, they learn about each other. Yet another unique concept. The way the characters' expressions differ when they're in the wrong bodies is great. I like the parallel and juxtaposition between their powers. Both are connected to emotions, but Raven has to control hers, while Starfire has to let hers loose. This provides an extra layer of conflict because each is not used to doing it the other's way. The duo slowly master each other's abilities and make progress on beating the Puppet King. I like the little detail of the Star Bolts being the main ability that Raven struggles with. The setup, along with her first usage of it being the final blow in defeating the villain, was a payoff straight out of a movie. It's also like the sonic boom in the first episode. The episode ends how it starts, except both Raven and Starfire enjoy what the other wants to do. Poetic Symmetry If I had to name a theme, I'd say it's, you should put yourself in others' shoes. Great episode. The only problem is how much the Titans drop their guard in the beginning. This is the first Beast Boy solo episode. Triton appears at the start to cause trouble. Right off the gate, the writers drop hints to the eventual plot twist, with the line, he's everywhere. These writers are consistently good at writing plot twists, and we haven't even seen the best one yet. With the Titans, Beast Boy's ego and need for attention are established. This will become part of the internal conflict. Trident being in three places at once is another subtle hint for first time viewers. Beast Boy wants to look cool in a scenario where he has a unique role, but Aqualad keeps outshining him. This is similar to Starfire's internal conflict in Sisters. Starfire and Raven falling for this fraud is questionable for their characters. He doesn't even look good. I think this is the first time Robin has made a joke at one of his friend's expenses. What's interesting is that I'm pretty sure Robin and Beast Boy never have an episode focused on them together. Beast Boy and Aqualad's rivalry gets stronger and so do the jokes. The mystery continues to build and it increases the rivalry. The external conflict influencing the internal conflict is great synthesis. It makes the whole episode come together. The animation is great. I like how the duo hashing out their issues leads to them solving the mystery. More great synthesis. Making the clones fight each other was a smart plan and the Chekhov submarine comes to save the day at the last minute. Aqualad becomes the first honorary titan. This will become important later. I'd say the theme is the same as the first episode. Manage your ego. At least it isn't the same characters learning the lesson. This was another great episode. Masks. This is a Robin focused episode that brings back the Slade plotline. It starts with an epic track titled Robot Assault and a battle against Slade's goons. Robin shows off his detective skills by being the one to track the goon. When Star gets shot, Robin shows that he's him by saving Starfire and stopping the goon in one move. He does this by jumping from a high place and using his grappling hooks. Slade shows an interest in Robin when they talk. This episode focuses on Robin's overarching flaw for the season, his obsessiveness. He usually chills with all of the titans in other episodes, but this time, he's obsessed with finding Slade and isolates himself. This obsession leads him to make questionable decisions. This obsession is reminiscent of some depictions of Batman, which is fitting since he's Batman's apprentice. I like how when he's obsessed, he's not unfriendly. The next scene introduces my favorite character, Red X. This man has the coolest design in the show and comes with a cool moveset. Red X steals what Slade was after and Robin is unable to join the titans. The clues that they place in every mystery episode are phenomenal. They're not too subtle, but not too hidden. Red X becomes him and single-handedly defeats the Titans. 
He targets each of their weaknesses without taking a hit and then dips. This man is elite. The track is also called Red X Appears. Red X then tries to partner with Slade. If you're an adult, you can probably figure out that Robin is Red X due to the hints. Robin was just obsessed with finding out Slade's plan. Then Red X shows up trying to trade the red card for Slade to let him in on his plans. Additionally, Robin was conveniently absent during the Red X fight. Robin's obsession, causing him to commit crime just to stop a criminal, is so mature and feels like a plot worthy of a Batman movie. Batman breaks the law to stop crime. Robin becomes a villain to stop a villain. It amazes me that the writers were willing to make their protagonist fall so far, but he looked cool while doing it. I like the little detail of Raven suppressing her emotions when the tape is removed, its consistency and continuity. Robin chasing X and getting captured was a good red herring. If I was watching this for the first time as an adult, I would start to question if Robin was really Red X. Red X makes the Titans look like fools again, but saving Beast Boy was another hint towards his identity. The song during this fight, Subway Face Off, shares a light motif with Red X appears. Slade says, Trust is easy to destroy, but tough to build. This is a true quote and will come up later. Robin is revealed to be Red X at the midpoint. This was a phenomenal plot twist. Robin leaving the hologram on his table was sloppy, but it is a clever explanation as to how he was chasing Red X. I believe this is the first episode we see Slade in full. Slade also figures out Robin's identity. Cyborg says Titans go. I don't know why Robin dishes the Red X suit when chasing Slade. His gear is far superior, and his swagger is too. During the chase, their similarities are highlighted. Slade calling out Robin's morality was cool. The two have a fight, and the stylish black silhouettes are used again to add visual flair. They've been used in other episodes, but they didn't look as cool. Both fighters use martial arts, but Slade is slightly better. When Robin gets the upper hand, Slade is one step ahead because this is another robot, like in the beginning. While they don't show it, I'm glad everyone was mad at Robin. It was the most logical reaction. And then the episode ends with even Starfire acknowledging Robin and Slade's similarities. The last line is, Slade did not trust you, and you did not trust us. That was a powerful way to close the episode. This is the first episode to end on a bad note. They stopped Slade from getting the chips, but Robin lost the trust of his team. The external conflict was won, but the internal conflict was lost. Trust is easy to destroy, but tough to build. That is the theme of the episode, and is illustrated wonderfully. Masks is probably my favorite episode in the entire cartoon. It highlights an interesting major character flaw in Robin. It has an amazing mystery. It has Red X. It sets up Slade as a foil to Robin, and it has a phenomenally mature theme. Even though the target demographic is kids, there was nothing childish about this episode. It tackled a theme valuable to adults and was brave enough to end it on a bad note. This was written by Greg Klein and Tom Pugsley. What else did they write? The duo wrote Nevermore, Wavelength, and The Prophecy. They were said to have worked on season 5, but they aren't credited for any specific episode. That's a good resume right there. The problem with episodics is that it's hard to carry over things from the previous episode, especially shifts in character dynamics. If each episode is supposed to be able to stand alone, you usually can't make major shifts in the dynamics. This is a problem because after the last episode, the Titans should have trust issues with Robin for all episodes leading up to the season finale, but I don't believe this is the case. Instead, everything resets. In this episode, the Titans start off captured by Mad Mod. This show has consistently done a great job at introducing its episodes in a quick and interesting manner. This is one of the few goofy episodes where there isn't really an internal conflict. I believe every season has at least one. Don't touch that dial with Control Freak is another one that comes to mind. The way Robin picks his handcuffs is familiar. I could swear Batman did something similar in JLU or another cartoon. If not, it's still very Batman-esque. I also like the detail that Robin uses his own equipment. In actual comics or other cartoons, he uses Bat-themed tech like Batarangs, but here, they make him his own hero and give him Robin-themed tech like Bird Rangs. This episode has no B-plot at all, it's just fun action and chase scenes. That's not bad, but it's not as good as the other episodes. Robin once again shows that he's him by being the first one to escape and save an ally. The song, Titans Repeat Grade, goes hard. I only noticed this when listening on Spotify. As you can see by their interactions, Star has seemingly forgotten about the stunt Robin pulled last episode. Or maybe time has passed and everyone already forgave him. That would also be disappointing, because I believe the consequences should have been shown for at least another episode to really hammer home the severity of his actions. Otherwise, it would feel like what he did wasn't even that bad. I don't think this episode has a theme. It was overall passable. Not great, but not bad.
This is a Cyborg and Raven episode that really focuses on the mechanic side of the former. This side has been shown in other episodes like Deep Six, but this is the first time the character trait has been put in the spotlight. This is the first appearance of the T-Car, built by Cyborg, which will stay in the story. The song that plays is called Cyborg's Baby, and it sounds so unique from anything before. This OST has so much range. I like how they add things to the setting that remain for the rest of the story. Where did he get that weird card from though? Raven is the only one who doesn't care, which makes her the perfect character to be paired with Cyborg this episode. The writers are so good at setting up conflict. Cyborg is shown to be obsessed with his car through his overprotectiveness of it and is boasting about it. This man stops to brag about his car while the other titans are fighting. More great setup. Overload being an electrical villain makes him the perfect antagonist for this episode. The strategy of soaking him was brilliant. I wish more fights had legitimate strategies for defeating foes, like the Batman 2004. Side note, that show probably had the best tactical fights out of any cartoon I've seen. There were plenty of times where Batman would fight a foe, lose, and then come back with a new strategy based on the first loss. He used the Batbot to beat Bane, used the Antifreeze suit to fight Mr. Freeze, and used the Bat Glider to fight Firefly. After the fight, the suspicious kid stole the T-Car. Cyborg is depressed and his obsession with the car is highlighted by the fact that he wants to go after the car before turning Overload in. And then Raven throws fuel on the flame by saying it's just a car. This pisses Cyborg off and he actually ditches the Titans to find his car. The scums get the car stolen by Gizmo. Side note, Gizmo is the only Hive member to appear in episodes without the rest. Why'd they choose him when Jinx is right there? To be fair, Gizmo, being a tech person, fits as another antagonist. The song is Gizmo Steals Car and this song also sounds epic. Cyborg momentarily bonding with the two thieves when talking about his car was funny and in character, once again showing his obsession with the T-Car. Raven comes to console Cyborg and realizes that the way she puts her soul into her powers is similar to the way Cyborg put his soul into the car. This is great writing, but a small issue is that we don't see what makes her change her mind. Her change just happens off screen. If there was at least a scene showing why she changed her mind, this would be perfect. Raven has an arc of disrespecting the T-Car to respecting the T-Car while Cyborg has an arc of having great value in the car to losing the value, then back to valuing it again. This is a full circle arc. I like how the start of Raven's arc is what caused Cyborg to fall, and the change from Raven's arc is what allowed Cyborg to rise again. Stealing the car of the thieves is nice poetic symmetry, and Raven being the one to help Cyborg after being the only one to have an issue with him is just phenomenal basic writing. The gizmo chase smoothly transitions into a Chekhov's overload. Gizmo crashes the T-car into the police truck carrying the villain, allowing him to take over it. The track playing during this scene is sick. The track is called Overload Takes Car. Overload then pulls a Green Goblin. That's what I'm going to start calling the event when a villain forces the hero to choose between two things they value. Overload forces Cyborg to choose between stopping him and preserving the T-Car. Now I gotta bring out my McKee quote. True character is revealed in the choices a human being makes under pressure. The greater the pressure, the deeper the revelation, the truer the choice to the character's essential nature. End quote. Cyborg has been perfectly set up as caring about his car more than crime stopping. He's been drooling over his car for this entire episode, but this is especially evident when he chooses to find his car overturning in overload. But here, he's put to the test, and he chooses to sacrifice his car to stop crime. Raven brings Cyborg out of his slump with an inspirational quote, which is probably the theme. The thing you loved about that car, the thing that made her special, it came from inside you. End quote. The theme could probably be extrapolated to, it's what's inside that counts. This causes the episode to end how it started, once again. This move is actually part of Dan Harmon's story circle, step 7 and 8 specifically. The hero returns to a familiar situation having changed. He's building the car like at the start, but this time Raven is helping. This is some movie level writing. They got the whole Pixar pairing together opposites thing going on, combined with great internal conflicts, arcs, climaxes, and antagonists. If you told me there would be a great Cyborg and Raven episode before this, I would have doubted you. But this ended up being one of my favorites from the season. Second favorite so far. Once again, I must remind you that there were no ripple effects from masks. No one has problems with Robin. This episode was written by Amy Wolfram. She also wrote a lot of terror episodes. Betrothed, The Quest, which I love. Troc, which is also great. The End Part 1, Trust, Calling All Titans Part 1, and Things Change. She's stacked when it comes to accomplishments in this story. Teen Titans might have had some of the best writers in the game. Now, we arrive at the two-part finale. This episode starts in Media Rays, with Robin chasing Slade, straight to business. The track during this scene is cool, it's called Robin's Enigma. Robin is kinda getting schooled by Slade, the only one colder than him. I like the little first-person shots they do during the action scenes, when we see the attack storm from the attacker's perspective. 
They're usually the best looking and most creative scenes. Slade says they're equally matched and equally ruthless, except Robin didn't land a single successful hit on Slade. Meanwhile, Slade caught this man's fist. Slade continues to go on about them being similar. The rocks that crash turn into his friends when Slade says, All you care about, you destroy. This message would have hit harder if there was a rift between his team in the last two episodes. Robin removes the mask and they pull in Empire Strikes Back when it's revealed to be Robin. Robin wakes up from the dream and Cyborg says that Slade's back. Great cold open. Maybe the greatest so far. I just realized this, but if Masks was episode 11 instead of episode 9, the weight of his actions would have carried on just fine. I was always hoping that Slade's plan wasn't a letdown since it's been hyped up for so long, but freezing the entire town does live up to the hype. I like how Slade just straight up tells them because he was too good at hiding it and he's so confident that they can't stop him. For the first time, the ripple effects from Masks take place. The Titans don't want Robin out on the field when it comes to Slade. Sadly, they just kinda trust him when he says he can handle it. The characterization in every episode has been wonderful except for the few times I've mentioned someone being out of character. The action directing stands out in this episode. The bit where Robin threw his staff, it came back to him, and then he immediately threw it at someone behind him was probably the best choreography the cartoon has delivered so far. Watching Robin steal everyone's goons is not only hilarious, but it's a great way of showing his obsession. When he started pummeling the beaten droid, it reminded me of Batman, specifically the 2022 movie. The song here is Robin Army of One. Robin interrogating the innocent guy also shows his obsession and feels Batman-esque. The fact that someone had to use their powers to stop him shows how far gone he is. And then BB comparing Robin to Slade puts the nail in the coffin. What's interesting is that an actual detective strategy is thinking like the criminal you're chasing. Robin seems to be metaphorically taking this to the extreme by also acting like Slade. I say metaphorically because I don't think that's his intention. I believe they are just similar people. Starfire's allergy is a little convenient, but I can let it slide because it was strange how the alien foreigner knew what chromium was as soon as it was mentioned, especially considering that Star is usually the clueless one, along with Beast Boy. I like how Robin tries to apologize because it shows his self-awareness. I also like the return of Cinderblock because it shows that Slade is using his pieces. This man really soloed Cinderblock. He's really him. Cinderblock holding a location with Slade's symbol was a little too obvious and should have triggered suspicion in Robin. He then pulls up on Slade with a quip as usual. In Forces of Nature, a joke was that Cyborg can't fly. I really don't understand why they made this decision. He's a half robot who can transform his body parts into other gear. Why can't he just make a jetpack or wings? This seems so strange, especially since he could fly in the Justice League movie. Meanwhile, Slade is schooling Robin and grabs his fist for the third time. Robin needs to grab Slade's fist before the finishing blow. That would be epic. The song during the fight is Robin finds Slade. After Slade allows Robin to get in a combo and grab the trigger, he reveals that he was several steps ahead. The trigger was fake, the detonator never existed, and the titans get shot with a laser, which was the real secret weapon. Slade's plan being to test Robin and force him to be his apprentice is the perfect plan for this season. The similarities have been highlighted several times, so to have his grand plan be for them to work together is beautiful poetry. And then his strategy of threatening his friends is perfect. The internal conflict, Robin being too similar to Slade, is tied to the external conflict, Slade forcing Robin to be his apprentice. Ending the episode with Robin in Slade's suit was crazy. Slade pulled a green goblin. He forced Robin to choose between keeping his friends alive and fighting crime. Robin chose his friends. Obviously this is one of the best episodes, but it's a little unfair because it's part of the season finale, which usually contains the best written episodes, especially since they are the finale to the overarching seasonal conflicts. Last episode. Apprentice Part 2 starts with the Titans searching for Robin. I love the reappearance of Cyborg's I should have known. Him blaming himself for an issue is an interesting way of dealing with grief and I'm glad it was kept consistent. Slade Robin appears and the Titans have to fight him. The song is titled Search for Robin, another great cold open. Robin being forced to not talk by Slade is a genius and believable way of not immediately solving the conflict. I like how even when Robin threatens Slade, he turns it into a positive by stating how similar they are. The concept of the main antagonist being a foil, an evil reflection of the protagonist, is a brilliant decision. I already have a father, along with the bats was a killer moment. Whoever wrote that deserves a raise. This two-parter was written by David Slack, who also wrote Divide and Conquer, the sum of his parts, How Long is Forever, Fractured, Aftershock with Wolfram, X, Spellbound, The Beast Within, Titan's Z's Part 1 and 2, Don't Touch That Dial, Birthmark, Overdrive, Mother May I, The End Part 3, and Go. This man is easily the MVP of the show. Look at that resume. Back to the show. I like how Batman never appears and is never explicitly mentioned. 
It furthers the motif of Robin being his own hero, not a sidekick. I like how Starfire is the only one that's in denial. It emphasizes her kindness and closeness to Robin. The Titans having to take down a former friend is a cool concept. So cool that it comes up again next season. The, mu <laughs> the music when Robin breaks in is cool. It's called Church for Robin. And seeing Cyborg as the new leader is also great consistency. He says Titans go. And then the fight takes place on the roof of Wayne Enterprise. A subtle nod to Batman. Slade forcing Robin to fight makes the scene more intense. Robin kind of shows that he's that guy again by soloing the Titans. But they aren't going all out on him. The moment when Robin and Star are in a standoff and she puts down her attack was powerful. Slade finally uses the Chekhov's probes because Robin couldn't shoot her. Great moment for Robin. When Robin returns, his fist is caught for the fourth time. This disrespect can't keep happening. Also, he's supposed to be good with quips. What the heck is motivate this? What is he, Vegeta? The two using staffs is another great parallel. This fight makes decent use of the location. I love the part where Slade appears and disappears due to the rotating gears. The choreography was solid, but not as good as that one sequence from the last episode. The Titans coming for Robin, despite the danger the probes pose, shows who they are on a deeper level. I like Starfire being the first to attack, since she trusts Robin the most. Robin choosing to put the probes in himself was a genius way to force Slade to stop, and a great moment that also showed what he valued most. He was willing to sacrifice his life to save his friends and stop a criminal. Earlier, Slade said that Robin hated to lose, which they both shared, so Robin saying, and I know you hate to lose, was a good callback. Robin caught Slade's leg, finally. It wasn't the fist, but it's good enough. The Teen Titans hit Slade with a mean combo and forced him to retreat. In the resolution, I like Starfire apologizing for doubting Robin for a moment. Even though the doubt was reasonable, she apologizes because it fits her character. Robin finally gets to admit that he and Slade are alike. But there is one big difference between me and Slade. He doesn't have any friends. This line was brilliant and showed what kind of foil Slade was. I even used this pair as an example of minimal juxtaposition in another video. A foil is a character that's used to highlight traits in another character. Total juxtaposition would be if every single trait was reversed in the other character. But Slade has minimal juxtaposition, which is where most traits are shared, except for one trait, which becomes highlighted in the character being foiled. Here, that trait is friendship. I guess the theme would be, friends keep you on the right path. Robin and his friends defeating a Batman villain shows that these characters aren't sidekicks in this universe. They're heroes. It's a symbolic passing of the mantle. That's why there are no adult heroes above them in this cartoon, and I respect that. That's the end of season 1. Is this the greatest season in western cartoons or western TV ever? Quite possibly. This was simply phenomenal. The plots in each episode were perfectly paced and even had well written mysteries from time to time. The characters were outstanding. The only major misstep was Forces of Nature with BB and Star. Other than that, they were enjoyable and consistent. The voice acting was also spectacular. Each episode, except for Mad Mod, had a theme that was valuable to all ages and properly executed. The setting was used to build on the external and internal conflicts in unique ways a couple of times. The art and animation looked crisp, and some of the music choices were excellent. The fight choreography was mostly just okay, but it did its job. The story had a mastery of setup and payoff, and several setups still haven't been paid off. The season was so good. And don't get me started on the OST. I'm elated that they finally released it, even if it's two decades later. The way songs are crafted for a specific scene and never reused is very movie-like, which is a worthy trait of a movie-quality cartoon. They made 98 songs for 13 episodes. There are three composers, Christopher Carter, Lolita Ritmanis, and Michael McQuiston. Sometimes one artist will work on all the songs in an episode. Those seem to be the times where light motifs appear. The only thing that would make the score better is if each Titan had their own light motif that played in songs relating to them across all seasons, just like how great movie scores do. The main villains, like Slade, should also have one too. Here's some trivia. McQuiston made the JLU theme, and Carter, made the Batman Beyond theme. Personally, I think this is far superior to Avatar. I used to have them on the same tier, but no longer. I might do a retrospective for Avatar, and that might change my mind, but as of now, Teen Titans is on a tier of its own when it comes to cartoons. My top episodes were Masks, Apprentice, Car Trouble, Nevermore, and Switched in that order. Phenomenal season. Can't wait to watch the next. Thank you for watching. Please like, comment, share, subscribe, and help me revolutionize the manga industry by buying my manga and spreading the word. All important links will be in the description.